Hi, all. Uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, webinar. I'm excited to share um, a group of really smart people, uh, colleagues, and friends to talk about antibody drug conjugates. The reason we're doing this in September is because September is Gynecologic Cancer Awareness Month. And so in the spirit of you know sharing all the new and exciting data in our field, this webinar seemed very, very appropriate. In terms of what to expect during this webinar, this is a brief agenda. First, we're gonna have Dr. Carrie Hacker discuss with us, uh, teach us what an antibody drug conjugate is. Um, those are known as ABCs. Uh, next, I have uh, Dr. Olivia Corey talking about one drug, Tivdac, and then Dr. Whitfield Grodin will be talking about Elegir, and Dr. Marina Sasenko will then talk about NHERT2. These are the three main uh, ADCs that uh, have received a lot of um, research and press lately. And then Dr. Michelle Lightfoot is going to talk to us about all the exciting ADC trials that are open at NYU for gynecologic cancers. And we will uh, try and save all the questions for the end. We'll have plenty of time for that. And as Katie Grace said, please uh, drop your questions in the Zoom chat, or um, you can feel free to turn your microphone on at the end and we could uh, speak your, your questions. And so I will pass the mic to Dr. Carrie Hacker, who is a GYN oncologist uh, at the Brooklyn campus as well as in Manhattan. Um, and she's going to teach us all about ADCs. Alrighty, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to speak, Dr. Gerber. Um, this is a brief overview of what an antibody drug conjugate is. Um, so this is the basic structure depicted here. Um, and they are a relatively new class of oncology drugs. And their goal is to bring a very highly effective chemotherapy directly to a tumor in hopes that if you bring the chemotherapy directly to the tumor that you may eliminate some of the side effects typically seen with chemotherapy and increase the effectivity of that chemotherapy. There are three main components to an antibody drug conjugate. The first part, which is this orange and green molecule, is a monoclonal antibody. And monoclonal antibodies are actually a component of the normal immune system that recognize um, abnormal proteins expressed either by tumors or expressed by um, pathogens like viruses or um, bacteria. And so we've sort of um, taken these monoclonal antibodies and worked them into um, treating cancer. And so we select a monoclonal antibody that's, that recognizes a protein that is preferentially or increased, has increased expression on the surface of tumors and has low expression in normal tissue. The second component is the cytotoxic payload. And basically that's the chemotherapy component of the antibody drug conjugate. This is a very potent chemotherapy that's actually too toxic to give by itself because it would cause too many side effects and, and kill too many normal cells. Um, the antibody and the um, cytotoxic payload are connected by this covalent linker. And this covalent linker is lysed once the antibody drug conjugate gets to the tumor and that releases the cytotoxic payload. And in a couple of slides, I'm gonna give a little bit more details on kind of how this works once it gets to the tumor. Um, antibody drug conjugates are given intravenously um, into the bloodstream and we can go on to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention some of the proteins or the targets that we are focusing on in gynecologic malignancies. Um, and these are proteins that are expressed on high levels in the tumors and low levels in normal tissue. Um, the first one I'm gonna talk about is folate receptor alpha. And this is a protein that we see um, in ovarian cancer, sorry. Um, and um, is a transmembrane protein that is involved in um, folate metabolism. Um, the others that I wanted to focus on because we're going to be talking about a little bit today are tissue factor. Um, and tissue factor is a protein that is expressed on the surface of um, cells, but is typically involved in blood clotting pathways. 
and that is expressed in cervical cancer and ovarian cancer, but has been used and targeted in cervical cancer, which I think Dr. Corey is going to talk about in a little bit. And then the third one that we can focus on today is HER2. And this is a transmembrane protein that's involved in sending um, kind of growth signals to normal and tumor cells. And this is expressed in ovarian, endometrial, and cervical cancers, as well as a variety of others. Um, there are a couple others that I think Dr. Lightfoot might be talking to you about today. So trope two um, is involved in calcium signaling, and then B7H4 is a protein involved in immune signaling, and these are um, targets that are under investigation currently. Um, so antibody drug conjugates, as I mentioned, are given directly into the bloodstream via IV. Um, and the monoclonal antibody portion targets or brings these molecules directly to the tumor where you have high levels of it, target protein expression. Once they arrive at the tumor, they bind to that protein on the surface of the tumor cells, and they get internalized through um, a pathway that's very common for internalizing proteins kind of throughout the body. Once they're internalized into these um, these kind of vesicles, the environment inside those vesicles links that, or sorry, cleaves that linker between the monoclonal antibody component and the chemotherapy component. And the chemotherapy is released into um, the internal portion of the cell. And also as the cell dies, it gets released into the neighboring um, portions of the tumor and can actually cause killing of neighboring tumor cells that may or may not express that target protein on the surface. Um, the chemotherapies are typically involved in cellular division. And so once the chemotherapy gets there, the cells can no longer um, grow and they, and they, they die. Um, and there you get your tumor killing. Um, I think that's about all that I have on the basics of ADCs. Um, so we will learn more about kind of how we're using them in GYN malignancies. Thank you, Dr. Hacker. That was a great overview. And so now I'm going to introduce Dr. Olivia Corey, who's going to talk about um, one of the first ADCs or the first ADC that was approved in gynecologic cancers. Um, she is, she works with me out on NYU in Long Island and, um, I'm very excited to hear what she has to say about this. Perfect. Thanks, Dr. Gerber, so much. And thank you, Dr. Hacker, for the introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So um, introducing our first ADC of the night, um, which I will refer to as TIVDAC, which is the trade name because the generic name is a mouthful, which is Tizotumab Vidotin. Um, so how does it work? What is TIVDAC? So just sort of like Dr. Hacker um, kind of explained to us, uh, TIVDAC is comprised of three different parts. So the antibody, which is the part that kind of binds to the transmembrane protein, in this case is tissue factor. Um, tissue factor is very prevalent on cervical cancer cells. It's also present on some normal epithelial cells throughout the body. And as Dr. Hacker mentioned, it does play a role um, both as a barrier on organs like the eye and the lung. Um, it also plays an important role uh, in creating blood clots. Um, the second part, if you look down on the slide, is the cytotoxic agent or what we call the payload, the part that's kind of active in fighting cancer cells and preventing cell reproduction. So in the case of TIVDAC, this is MMAE, um, which, is, which disrupts microtubules, which are important in cell division and replication. So that's the way that this particular drug kind of targets rapidly dividing cancer cells. Um, and the last part, the last component <clears throat> on the bottom right there is just a protease linker, um, which after this, this drug gets internalized into the cancer cell, gets broken down in the lysosomes, and that's how the, cytoto and the cytotoxic agent is released in them, and then becomes active and leading to cell death in those cancer cells. Okay, perfect. So this is, again, just kind of going through that process. You can see um, an image of the antibody binding, getting sort of internalized into the cancer cell, um, and those blue kind of spindle-like projections at the bottom of that cell are the microtubules. And so again, they're, they're involved in DNA replication and cell replication. So when that gets disrupted, this signals to the body that this cell should be um, killed through apoptosis. And so that kills cancer cells. 
Okay, so who is a candidate for this medication for TIVDAC? So this has been FDA approved just since April of this past year, actually, for adult patients with cervical cancer that has either returned after being treated with chemotherapy or um, in patients who present with metastatic cervical cancer, meaning a cancer that originated in the cervix but spread to other parts of the body at the time of diagnosis. Um, and then, of course, there are some people who should avoid this medication. So patients who are pregnant or breastfeeding, if they are breastfeeding at the time of diagnosis, which unfortunately with cervical cancer, we do see this in younger patients. Um, so we do recommend cessation of lactation and, uh, and avoiding breastfeeding for at least three weeks after the last dose of TIVDAC. Um, TIVDAC is also processed by the liver, so patients with liver failure or liver impairment should also be cautious, talk to their oncologist before receiving this medication. Um, and then this medication has a lot of side effects in the eye. So anyone with a history of eye diseases, what we call ocular surface diseases, um, including conjunctivitis and keratopathies, um, should avoid this drug as well, or at least consult with an ophthalmologist prior to starting. Um, Steven Johnson syndrome is a is a type of allergic reaction, severe allergic reaction. So anyone who's had this kind of reaction in the eye um, is not a candidate for TIVDAC. Uh, and similarly, patients with pre-existing peripheral neuropathy, numbness or tingling in the fingers or feet um, after prior chemotherapy should also kind of discuss with their oncologist before starting this. And then finally, as we mentioned, tissue factor is really important in creating blood clots and preventing bleeding. So anyone really predisposed to bleeding issues um, should, should also avoid this drug. Okay, so how is TIVDAC administered? Um, so logistically, this is administered through an IV or, or a port if a patient has a, a port already. Um, and it's given one day every three weeks, like many of the chemo, traditional chemotherapy agents and the other ADCs that we, that we give. The infusion time is about 30 minutes, um, and you know we continue this for as long as it's effective and as long as patients are tolerating the medication. So, is it effective? So, you know, unfortunately, when cervical cancer has progressed through chemotherapy and come back, it's extremely difficult to treat. Or, similarly, if it's progressed after chemotherapy when it presents in advanced metastatic stages. So. If you look at this image on the bottom here on the right side, you can see that our overall response rate to traditional chemotherapies in this setting is low, it's about 5%. So TIVDAC um, did perform better than that in clinical trials. Uh, so the, the response rate to TIVDAC in patients like this was actually closer to 18%, so compared to 5%. And when we talk about response rate, that means that we see a clinical response um, either on PET scans or CAT scans or clinically um, in terms of the disease that we're able to feel and see. And this is, you know, a little bit busy, these slides looking again, sort of at the efficacy, but, um, you know, there was a big study that was the basis for getting TIVDAC approved, FDA approval for cervical cancer patients, and it included over 500 patients um, with this type of cervical cancer, either advanced or recurrent. Um, and it did find that did show that TIVDAC was more effective at preventing cancer progression and more effective at prolonging life. So, whereas standard chemotherapy um, it, patients had about on average 2.9 months of treatment before their disease progressed. Um, and an overall survival of nine and a half months, TIVDAC did better. So for, it was four months until most patients um, experienced disease progression and the overall survival was closer to a year. So um, at least, you know, at least several months of improvement there. So what are our, some alternative treatments to TIVDAC? So standard cytotoxic chemotherapies, which um, just target rapidly dividing cells, um, immunotherapy is an option for patients who haven't received it before. And because, you know, this is a difficult stage at which to treat, uh, this is a difficult setting um, to treat, uh, we always talk about best supportive care as an alternative as well. 
Okay, and so what are some of the side effects? So we've touched on some of these already, but just to kind of go through them in a little bit more detail. So eye ocular toxicities or side effects in the eye are the most common um, and the most common reason that patients discontinue this medication. In fact, the medication comes with a black box warning because it affects over half of patients who take this medication. Um, the most common changes are vision uh, loss or changes in vision, um, dry eye, some eye pain and irritation. Some patients describe this as the sensation of having something kind of stuck in the eye or a general discomfort. Um, others experience increased tear production or discharge, and, and this can lead to corneal ulceration. So it's really important. We, we part as oncologists partner with ophthalmologists and optometrists to really uh, help manage the eye toxicities with patients who are on TIVDAC. Um, peripheral neuropathy affected about 39% of patients, and nosebleeds and bleeding in general, prolonged bleeding affected also about half of patients who are on TIVDAC. Um, pneumonitis, which means inflammation in the lungs, was much more rare at less than 1%, but this is a serious toxicity. So, um, you know, we always ask, you know, we always ask patients about cough or, um, you know, sometimes we, we find this on, on lung imaging as well. Skin reactions were also rare, rare um, and embryo fetal toxicity is, is a concern as well. Okay, so what do we do to prevent some of these side effects? So we try to get ahead of these ocular side effects with really good eye hygiene and eye care. So before we start anyone on TIVDAC, um, we do have them see an ophthalmologist and eye doctor before to, to discuss, to do a baseline exam, a slit lamp exam, um, and also to start on some important eye drops. So on the day of infusion, um, we, we give two different types of eye drops um, as a preventative measure. So one is a steroid drop and the other is a vasoconstricting drop, which means that it constricts the blood vessels in the eye. And this does mitigate a lot of the side effects that we see um, in terms of the eye. So this continues throughout the day of the infusion and then on days two and three after the infusion as well. Um, and it does require sort of uh, being, being pretty on top of as a patient. So this is the sort of most labor intensive part of being on TIVDAC. Um, throughout treatment, you know, we just ask patients to really notify us if they're noticing any changes in their eye health or their, or their vision. Um, and again, we work closely with our ophthalmology colleagues to, to kind of treat these things as they come up. Lubricating eye drops we give as well as needed um, throughout treatment. And, uh, and we tell patients to avoid contact lenses. Get get cute glasses frames. So what are some other medications to be aware of TIVDAC interacting with? So there are some antibiotics, some anti-cancer agents. Um, tamoxifen is the one that people are usually the most familiar with, which is a breast cancer maintenance drug. Um, Anti-HAV agents and other antivirals, um, antihypertensive some sex, sex steroids, um, and then herbal uh, supplements as well. So just important as always to kind of let on your oncologist know what medications you're taking um, and a complete list, including herbal supplements are really important just to make sure that there's no interaction there. So in summary, TIMDAC is a treatment option for patients with recurrent or metastatic cervical cancer that's progressed through standard chemotherapy. Um, it's been shown to have really promising results in terms of increased survival. Um, the toxicities tend to be very manageable, the most common of which is, are, the, are the eye toxicities. Um, this is treating advanced cervical cancer is still a big challenge for us in G1 oncology. So unfortunately, this is not a panacea. It's not a cure-all, but um, certainly gives us a lot of hope. Um, and, you know, just we're, we're, we're hopeful that we're going to continue to improve with targeted therapies as well. That's all I have on TIVDAC. All right. Thank you, Dr. Corey. That was very insightful. Um... Next up is Dr. Grodin, who is a GYN oncologist at our NYU Manhattan campus, and he's going to talk to us about another new and exciting uh, ADC. Perfect. Thank you so much, Didi. I really appreciate it. Um, so I am going to be talking about uh, mervituximab thoroptensine, and I'm going to refer to that as MERV. Um, and I wanted to sort of go through the past, present, and future of this FDA-approved therapy. 
And so we can go on. So Merv is an antibody drug conjugate. It has a, a myotansinoid DM4 payload. It has potent antitubulin activity. And as Carrie sort of discussed, this is an ADC that essentially it will bind to the folate receptor. It's basically involved in a lot of very fundamental functions for DNA creation. And um, specifically, Specifically, it was shown that in ovarian cancer, um, over 95% of high-grade ovarian cancers expressed the folate receptor. So this seemed like a relatively good target to think about. I think a lot of what's important about MERV to understand is that there's a little bit of a story. And in science, sometimes what happens is you try something and it doesn't work, but then you go back and figure out why it didn't work. And then you identify the population that it really works works in. That's very relevant here. There was a large randomized clinical trial called FORWARD-1. And uh, what they what was done in this setting was patients with platinum-resistant ovarian cancer were randomized to either getting conventional chemotherapy or getting mervatuximab. And what was found was that if you looked at the whole group of patients, hundreds of patients, what they found was that there was really no benefit. Um, to giving mervatuximab to this antibody drug conjugate. Um, but when they did a subset analysis in this forward one that was not pre-specified, they found that the patients that had high expression levels of the folate alpha receptor, they essentially found out that those patients responded better and it was borderline even you know, statistically significant for progression-free as well as overall survival. So importantly, they thought, well, maybe if we just look at a specific group of patients with platinum-resistant ovarian cancer, maybe we'll get somewhere with mervatuximab. So in the phase two Soraya trial, essentially they identified patients that only had high expressing tumors, and they demonstrated that there was a significant response rate of approximately 32%. And six patients out of their cohort experienced a complete response. You can see the waterfall plot off to the right. Um, what was important about this and really impressed ultimately the FDA was that there was a close to seven month duration of response. And what they noticed, the investigators allowed one to three prior lines with platinum resistant ovarian cancer. And what was observed was that if you gave mervatuximab earlier in the course, there were improved response rates compared to getting it. So people that got it after one prior line responded better than patients that received it after three prior lines. And so this led to an FDA accelerated approval um, in, in 2022. This led to the Mirasol phase three randomized clinical trial. And this was in patients with FR alpha high expressors greater than 75%. So these are the patients whose ovarian cancers overexpressed the target of this antibody drug conjugate. And what they found was that there was a very high response rate that exceeded that of the current standard of care, which would have been topotecan liposomally encapsulated um, doxorubicin or pegylated lipodox, doxel, um, or paclitaxel. And so you can see this sort of side by side. I, I put the waterfall plot so you can really experience the visual of how MERV really exceeded the response rates. Now, you know, waterfall plots, you know, are, are really just moments in time of the best response. They don't tell you about survival. But what was important about the Mirasol trial was that there was a significant progression-free and overall survival benefit. And this is really the bar that the FDA uses to approve medications in this space. And what I'll really highlight to you is that there was a significant progression-free survival, which was their primary endpoint. And then they also met the bar of overall survival. Patients were actually living longer if they were given mervatuximab as opposed to conventional cytotoxic chemotherapy. And I think that is really what has led to mervatuximab for patients with folate overexpressing ovarian cancer in the platinum resistant setting. Really, they should be treated with mervatuximab. And, and you know, if you look at the, the Soraya data, you would say you would want to treat them as maybe the first thing that you give them really should be mervatuximab. 
Now, you know, uh, Olivia talked a lot about Tiv, TivDAC, and TivDAC's the other major ADC in the GYN space. Uh, Mervotuximab is, 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 a, is also an ADC. It's given every three weeks. Um, the infusion time is a little bit longer. It tends to be closer to three hours. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, Mervotuximab is an antitubulin agent. It's different um, than, than TivDAC, but essentially it has some overlapping toxicities with paclitaxel, so it needs to be run in a little bit slowly. But I think the take-home about the toxicity that we see with Mervotuximab is really highlighted in the phase three trial, where this is a great graph that looks at what the toxicity would look like with the other conventional therapies and then shows what Mervotuximab looks like. And you can see the conventional chemos are in blue and Mervotuximab is sort of in the, the orange brown. And you can see that if you look at hematologic general GI, Mervotuximab is either under or similar to conventional cytotoxic chemotherapies with regards to its side effects. So we're not introducing anything new. There is ocular toxicity seen with mervatuximab. And I really want to highlight that it's different than what we see with TID TIDVAC. Um, you know, and it really includes blurred vision, keratopathy, and dry eye. These tended to be very low grade. There were no episodes of blindness. This was something that was really a very manageable toxicity. And when, when patients got this toxicity, they were able to get this managed. And it only accounted for less than 2% of discontinuations as a result of MERV, which stands in contrast to TIVDAC. Overall, Mervatuximab was stopped for toxicity about 9% of the time. And that's important because let's say you were to use a benchmark of say like PARP inhibitors. Well, Olaparib in the SOLO1 trial was stopped 11% of the time. So in patients that need to get PARPs, about 11% couldn't tolerate it. Mervatuximab appears to be similar to that, if not maybe a little bit less. And this is in a heavily pretreated population. The current FDA label for Mervatuximab really states that we should be, as we're treating people, we should be having an ophthalmologic assessment every other cycle for the first eight cycles. And we recommend lubricating drops as well as steroid drops. The lubricating drops you use all the time. The steroid drops, you really focus on using those in the first week, a little bit before and a little bit after at a very specific prescription. And this has been shown to mitigate the toxicity. What's important is that these data that you're seeing in front of you, they were not in the trial. We weren't actually doing this eye regimen. This was only done in the patients that developed the eye symptoms. And so really the important thing is, is that if you develop the eye symptoms, it really requires holding the mervatuximab until the eye symptoms really resolve, which almost invariably they do. Um, I did wanna highlight how mervatuximab has permeated into the NCCN guidelines. And this is also an option for us. This is where it begins to permeate into platinum resistant as well as platinum sensitive ovarian cancer. Uh, the FORWARD2 trial was a trial that came out looking at patients with FR alpha expressing tumors. These patients had tumors that were greater than 25%. Remember I said that Mirasol was for high expressors, greater than 75. And what the investigators did here was they merged mervatuximab with bevacizumab. And they found real efficacy in patients with platinum resistant ovarian cancer. I'm showing you the platinum resistant cue for forward two. There is a platinum sensitive cue that also led to a excellent efficacy. But I wanted to highlight it here because this is where we really think about mervatuximab. They found that their in platinum resistance was a 44% response rate, very similar to almost single agent in Mirasol. But what's important here is that this is for patients whose tumors were not overexpressing. You remember in forward one, if you didn't express the target, patients didn't respond quite as well. In this case, the addition of the bevacizumab might be boosting up the response rate to almost be similar to that what we would see with, oh, with high expressors. Um, they saw a very long duration of responses. You know, we don't really go chasing waterfalls. What we really like doing is, is we really focus on the spider plot, which is in the middle there, where you can see deep, durable responses. Um, what I think is interesting here is that off to the right in that graph, they look at the responses in this small cohort that's under 100 patients. And what they found 
was that it didn't matter what your FR alpha expression level was. You had a, a similar response. You can see that the overall response rate was, or the, the PFS was, was the best in the high expressors, but you were getting statistically similar responses across the spectrum of folate expression. So as a result of this trial, I think, the NCCN listed um, Merv, Patuximab in combination with Bevacizumab. This is something that we can use. We can offer this to our patients. Um, and so that I think is a great utilization of Merv that I think is gonna be explored further. Hot off the press is the, is the Piccolo trial. This is a phase two trial that was presented about three days ago in uh, Barcelona. Um, in this trial, they were looking at patients with FR alpha high expression. And they demonstrated that single agent MERV efficacy was actually very, with a good response rate in late line platinum sera, platinum sensitive ovarian cancer. This is an interesting trial because what they're looking at is patients that have received two prior platinum lines, but are still maintaining their platinum sensitivity. We encounter this, it, it, it's not the most common thing, but we actually encounter this and our enthusiasm for giving more carboplatinum in this setting is a little bit limited. It can be limited by allergy. It can be limited by the fact that they really have a lot of hematologic side effects and can't get through it. So these patients were given as a phase two trial, which means everybody gets the medicine, they were given mervituximab. And what's important here is they found about a 52% response rate. Um, and the duration of, of response was actually measured in sort of eight to nine months. Um, if you look at the response rate, which is really one of the goals of a phase two trial, what I wanted to highlight here was that in patients that had previously gotten PARP inhibitors, which is close to 50 to 75% of patients, even 100% could get PARPs up front, they're seeing a very good response rate in the sort of 45% range in previously treated, even patients that progressed on PARP. And this was really highlighted in the discussants comments three days ago. You know, what, what Dr. Martin had said was that the publications coming out about patients that respond to chemotherapy after PARP is that the response rates are 11 to an upwards of 40% with a lot of people PARP inducing and almost platinum resistance, which is going to be a real problem moving forward. It seems like mervituximab might overcome that. That 46% response rate in Piccolo actually, it, it, it actually looks very favorable. That, that's a good signal. I mean, obviously it's a phase two, so you have to take it with a grain of salt. So that's an exciting new use, which, you know, I, it may be NCCM listed. This is brand new, so we don't really know what its fate will be. Um, the future for MERV is maintenance therapy. We're looking at this with bevacizumab as a maintenance in second line well, or in platinum sensitive maintenance after a partial or complete response with a, with a platinum dub doublet. I think that's a real winner. If, if it works in platinum resistance, it's probably going to be very effective as a maintenance. And then they're also looking at merging it with carboplatin, which kind of makes sense. I mean, Taxol is merged with carboplatin and mervituximab is essentially an ADC that recapitulates the mechanism of action of Taxol. So, you know, stay tuned for that. We can go to the next one. So that's really what I wanted to sort of re review just in conclusion. You know, Merv really is the first FDA approved for ovarian cancer specifically um, in high folate receptor alpha expression, platinum resistant ovarian cancer. It requires a companion biomarker, which makes the scientists and me very excited. We're gonna find the people that are most likely to respond, but you can see there might be options for lower expression as well with MERV-BEV combinations. Um, and then the toxicity tends to be less than conventional cytotoxics, save the ocular things, which are different than TIVDAC, because this tends to be very manageable, resolvable, and it doesn't account for a large amount of discontinuation of, of MERV like it does with TIVDAC. So anyways, thank you. We can go to the next slide. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Grodin. That was, uh, you know, hot off the presses. And so our, you know, everyone participating here is getting first access to the new Something stuff. new. Love it. Uh, next, we're going to discuss another <clears throat> really new and exciting ADC that's being used. Dr. Marina Sasenko is going to talk to us about in her too. Um, she is a GUN oncologist at the Manhattan campus as well. And um, I'll give it over to her. Thank you. Um, 
All right, so we have the new kit on the block. This is probably the most recent uh, medication that we've started using in GYN cancers, and I will be referring to it by its uh, brand name as well, mostly because the uh, generic is quite the, the uh, mouthful. So we'll, we'll go with NR2. Next slide, please. So what is it? So we've talked about what ADCs are in general, um, but this one specifically is directed at the HER2. Um, some of you may be familiar with HER2 from uh, breast cancer. Uh, a, a buddy of an HER2, trastuzumab, is the HER2-directed drug that has been used in breast cancer now for quite a while. Um, we've actually also started using it in um, some of our gynecologic cancers. Um, so maybe some of you have heard about, heard, heard about it from that perspective. Um, what's interesting about NHER2 is that it is one of the few ADCs that is approved for use um, in any cancer, solid cancer, that is um, HER2 positive. So it's not specific for ovarian or, or uterine or cervix or really any GYN cancer. It, is, it can be used for cancers that are tested for HER2 and come back with a three plus using um, immunohistochemistry. Uh, these patients ideally have gotten prior systemic therapy and ideally do not have any other uh, satisfactory treatment options available to them. So let's talk about the data. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, the FDA recently approved an HER2 for metastatic previously treated solid tumors that are HER2-3+. And this is based on the Destiny Phase two trial. Um, the trial gave the drug at a concentration or a dose of 5.4 milligrams per kilogram every three weeks in patients with either 2 plus or 3 plus for two overexpressing tumors. Um, and out of the 276 patients that were treated, a decent number were actually GYN cancer patients because our cancers uh, tend to be the most common to have the hard to expression outside of breast cancer. So there were 40 endometrial cancer patients, 40 cervical cancer patients, and 40 ovarian cancer patients. Overall, 99%, 99 patients had an objective response. And an objective response basically means they either had um, partial response or complete response to, to the treatment. Um, for, it's actually should be 75% for endometrial, sorry, not 7%. 50% uh, for cervical and 45 for ovarian. So a really large number of patients um, have some benefit from this from this treatment. For the HER2-3 plus group, this was a much smaller sub, uh, subgroup of patients, but the overall response rate was even better at 85% for endometrial, 75 for cervical, and 60, almost 64 for um, ovarian. You'll notice the number of patients in each of these groups for HER2-3 for, uh, HER2 plus is quite small. Um, only 13 patients endometrial, eight cervical, and 11 ovarian. But even though the numbers are small, the results really are quite impressive. Um, so this, I just wanted to highlight the GYN specific response rates. So, so endometrial cancer and overall response rate of 57%. Um, over 77% of the patients have, were heavily pretreated, so considering two lines of treatment or more. And in those who were HER2-3+, her the overall response rate was 85%. Their median overall survival was um, almost two years and 26 months. And for patients for whom the, this is a recurrent disease and having a hard time being treated, um, that's actually a, not, a, not a number to sneeze at. Um, with cervical cancer, about 50% overall response rate. Again, very heavily pretreated group, meaning that 85% have seen other treatments. Um, some of you may know we don't have a lot of very effective options in cervical cancer. Um, so this is really is for patients who are HER2-3+, plus, this really is a um, game changer at 75% overall response rate. And um, the overall response rate for patients who are HER2-3+, plus was actually uh, not reached. I'm sorry, the overall survival was not reached, which is pretty impressive. Finally, in ovarian cancer, about 45% response rate with a uh, median treatment number of lines was three. Um, and I think it's important to note that a third of these patients had at least five prior lines of treatment. So, you know, with ovarian cancer, we have um, more treatment options that we, we can offer. And even in this group, the patients who are heavily pretreated had really nice response rates. Main side effects. So 
similar to the other medications that we've already talked about, almost everyone had some sort of adverse event. Most common were the kind of things that we think about in our um, in all of our treatment uh, modalities. So nausea, vomiting, anemia, diarrhea, neutropenia. These were kind of the most common and we kind of see this in most of our medications. The more specific side effects that we worry about and monitor in um, with this medication are that we monitor uh, the heart because patients can have heart problems. So these uh, patients who are on this medication will have regular um, heart ultrasounds or echoes. Um, and the other side effect that's actually been quite concerning and so we watch for it very closely is uh, pneumonitis, which is basically an inflammation of the lungs. And about 10% of patients uh, had this side effect and some of them, a few of them were fatal cases. So what we watch for here are cough, shortness of breath, fevers, kind of specifically respiratory symptoms. And our goal is to start treating it quickly and usually with steroids and hold the medication until, um, until the, 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 the side effect moves, uh, or is, is resolved. So the bottom line, the bottom line is that this is an extremely promising drug for patients who have tumors that overexpress HER2, ideally three plus, and have few other um, good option treatments available to them. And again, cervical, ovarian, and endometrial cancer patients have all been shown to have um, HER2 overexpression. The FDA approval is based on very positive results, but a fairly small number of patients. And so they continue to gather additional information to make sure that the, the results in the small group of patients is verified. And side effects can range from being quite mild, like nausea or low blood count, which we can monitor and adjust for, all the way to severe but rare of pneumonitis or um, heart problems. All right, thank, thank you, Dr. Sasenko. That was great. And um, now I wanna pass the mic over to Dr. Lightfoot. Um, one of the questions that came through the chat that I was briefly glancing at was about you know, how to stay, how do we keep our patients um, up to date with the current clinical trials, the current data? And so I think your talk is really gonna highlight that and we're excited to hear it. Great, thank you. Yeah, so I will just be highlighting a few to, a few of the um, trials that we currently have open. There are some that, um, you know, are opening or were open. So I just want to highlight up front that this is constantly changing um, and probably the best way at any site where you're getting care um, to know exactly what's happening is to ask your provider directly what clinical trial options are available. and while I'm highlighting the ones that focus on uh, antibody drug conjugates, there are of course many trials open that have other mechanisms of action. So that work in different ways that could also be of a benefit. And so um, probably the best way is if you're established with a provider, have that discussion with them. Um, clinicaltrials.gov is another resource that everyone has access to where you can see trials that are available, um, not just even at your site, but um, within the city, within the state, across the nation. So um, sometimes that can be a little bit um, overwhelming because there's options, but it is a resource for everyone. So we can go to the next slide. So as you've heard from everybody else today, and they've done an excellent overview, you, you know, we all see a lot of promise and have a lot of hope in the um, this class of medications. And so I'm just going to highlight some of uh, the ongoing trials that we have. So I separated these really by um, cancer site. Um, and so for our ovary cancer, you heard a lot from Dr. Ground about mervituximab. And you know, right now the approval that we have for that is in what's called the platinum resistant setting, meaning, you know, the can the ovary cancer has quit responding to our some of our typical chemotherapies. So one of our trials that is currently open is looking at, well, if it works perhaps in the later line for some patients with ovary cancer, what if we moved it and used it earlier? Could we still see um, benefit from that? And so as he talked about, the target for this is the FR alpha. And actually, 
it's not MMAE, but the, you know, it's an anti-tubulin. And so there, you're going to see a lot, most of the payloads have some overlap. And that, remember the payload is the chemotherapy that's actually delivered to the cell. Um, so some of the key criteria that somebody would have to meet in order to enter into this trial would be that you have a specific subtype of ovary cancer. Um, and um, we always look at the number of prior treatments somebody has had. So that's the line of therapy. And so for this trial, you actually can't have had too many prior um, chemotherapy treatments. But if you are somebody whose cancer has recurred and you're on um, a, a chemotherapy that includes a platinum drug and are having a good response, this trial would be a maintenance therapy option for once you complete chemotherapy. And so you would actually enroll in this trial probably while you're on chemotherapy or toward the end. And the opportunity that this trial gives would be to get the mervotuximab earlier uh, as an earlier line of therapy in your um, cancer treatment. We're also looking, um, there are several options for using um, antibody drug conjugates in um, patients whose cancers have stopped responding to some of our typical um, chemotherapy agents, like the platinum agents. And so um, I highlighted a few here. So GOG3086 is one that ha uses a new type of drug that you didn't hear about today, um, but it has a target that is also FR alpha. And then to the MMAE, but it's this company's own other anti-tubulin. They are um, investigating a drug we call Sutro because the names are very complicated. And again, in this trial, you have to have a specific subtype of ovary cancer. Um, you could have had a few more lines of therapy, so up to one to three prior treatments. And as long as those are not um, treatments such as mervituximab, which is a similar class of medications, um, otherwise there are not um, you know, um, key restrictions on um, the exact chemotherapies you had. And you do have to have expression of the target, which is the FR alpha. Um, in this trial, I know, um, I think it, one of the questions was also relating to kind of phases of trial. And so, um, you know, I will highlight, this is a trial where it's not getting compared to anything. So you would get the drug um, and, uh, so that's something that is beyond the scope of this, but some you know, discussion you'd also want to have with your um, provider as you're thinking about any of these as options. We also have another GOG trial, uh, GOG3096, and um, this one actually has a unique target, which you heard about from Dr. Hacker at the very beginning, so the CDH6, which we think um, is overexpressed, particularly in ovary cancers. And the mechanism of this one is um, going to be more similar to the NHER2 that Dr. Stasenko talked about. So again, you could have received more than one prior line, but no more than uh, three prior treatments for the cancer. This trial does require a fresh biopsy, meaning you would have to get a new biopsy from a site that your provider saw uh, typically on a CAT scan. And if, your tumor is known to have the FR alpha, then it is required that you received the mervituximab in the past. Um, and then they don't allow, if you've had a different type of antibody drug conjugate, so a different target typically, but the chemotherapy side of that was the same as this one, then you wouldn't be able to enroll on this trial. And this is another trial where you would get the drug. You can go to the next one. Um, there's a couple others. So we have um, Duality Bio, uh, which is a drug called DB1303. And so the target on here is HER2. So um, similar to what Dr. Stasenko was talking about within HER2. So the target's the same. The chemotherapy is also a tromboisomerase inhibitor. And then this trial um, allows, so you know, when we're deciding, for example, if somebody can get in HER2, we're looking at how much of the HER2 is expressed on their tumors. And so this one does allow a range of expression. Um, and you could have had up to three prior treatments for your cancer, but you couldn't have had an antibody drug conjugate 
that um, was targeting the HER2. We also have a, a newer trial that's opening, and you're going to hear about this because they have a few different types of cancers that they allow on the trial. So this is called the LOXO trial. Uh, this one targets FR alpha um, and has the a chemotherapy side that is uh, similar to the INHER2, so similar kind of class of chemotherapy. And this is also for patients who have had um, have uh, recurrent cancer. Um, and uh, for this one, they don't limit the number of prior treatments. So again, when you meet with your provider, what they would do is sit down and kind of look at all of these as options and then decide kind of what order these could be options for you um, and so that you could optimize, you know, say you enroll in one trial and then that doesn't work so that you'd have future options um, based on the number of prior lines here that they uh, allow. So we can go to the next one. For uterine cancer, there is some overlap. So you're going to see some of the same trials and that's just because we think that there's opportunity for these to work in different types of cancers. Um, so the GOG3095 is a trial that is targeting trope two. So that is one that Dr. Hacker also talked about. We think uh, we know that this one, trope 2, is overexpressed in certain types of cancers and in particular endometrial cancer and also can be associated with um, the cancer being sort of more aggressive or higher risk. And so that's the target for this one. And then it's in that same class of medic uh, chemotherapies called topoisomerase inhibitors. Now, this trial is comparing the, um, the antibody drug conjugate, which in this case has the name MK2870 versus chemotherapy. So it's not guaranteed that you would get the antibody drug conjugate in this trial, which is different than some of the ones I've talked about already. But what would happen is you would um, agree to sign up for the trial and then you get assigned to one of the groups and your doctor would choose the type of chemotherapy out of two options that we think have the best chance of working for recurrent uterine cancer. Um, and, or you'd get the antibody drug conjugate. And so this one allows up to three prior treatments and you couldn't have had an antibody drug conjugate targeting the trope two. Now I talked about the duality bio and the LOXO already, but those do also have options for patients with endometrial cancer. Um, for cervix cancer, so we uh, also have duality bio 1305 and this one's actually a, a trope two targeting with the topoisomerase inhibitor. And so this, as long as you, if you have recurrent cervix cancer um, and have received some of the treatments that we know have the best chance of working in recurrent cervical cancer, so that's including a, a drug called uh, bevacizumab um, or an anti pdl one if you were eligible for that, so that's a checkpoint inhibitor or type of immunotherapy, um, and you've received up to two prior treatments for your cervix cancer, then you'd be eligible for this one. And then that LOXO trial, which is an FR alpha targeting antibody drug conjugate also allows for recurrent cervical cancer to enroll. And I think we can go to the next slide. Yes. That's it. So um, thank you to our speakers for you your participation in this. I learned a lot and I know, I, I hope our uh, participants learned a lot as well. Um, we got some really interesting questions in the Q&A. So I'm just going to read them out and whoever, you know, whoever it speaks to can, uh, can feel free to answer. In terms of um, monitoring treatment for any, any different medication we're giving uh, for a cancer, we want to see you um, before every treatment to make sure that your side effects aren't too bad, to make sure that you're tolerating the treatment well. Um, and we also want to do an exam to make sure there's evidence that the, the treatment is working. Uh, throughout your treatment, you likely will have um, a blood tests, if there's a tumor marker that we're monitoring, or a uh, some sort of imaging, some sort of scan um, to assess if the treatment is working. As with any cancer treatment, we do not want to let you have any of the toxic side effects if there's no benefit, if it's not working. And so we, when we have recurring cancer, we often check at regular intervals just to make sure that it's, uh, it's 
working and we're also checking on your side effects uh, with each cycle. I don't know. Do, do you do you feel like ADCs, you have a different monitoring other than the sort of ophthalmologic things that we talked about, and maybe the ILD is a little different, but otherwise it's, it's essentially chemotherapy, right? Yeah. Like we don't really necessarily do a lot of different things. And I think it's about knowing which ADC you have and then doing the extra stuff associated with that that might be different than what you would otherwise be doing for conventional cytotoxics. Is that sort of what you found? For sure. Um, I think there's general side effects that we're going to be monitoring for during your treatment. And then there's the specialized ones in terms of whatever specific medication. But in general, we we monitor and we ask a lot of the same questions often. Well, that, that's a very good question. I mean, I think that's what patients really want to know is they want to know wherever they are, how, how long is it going to take to sort of manifest a response? And I think in, at least for merpituximab, what we saw was that responses manifest within the first two to three cycles. And so a lot of times the first assessments that they did on a lot of these clinical trials were sort of every six to eight weeks. And we were seeing responses early. I know with a lot of the HER2 ADC trials that we were running, um, and that we're currently running right now at NYU, we sometimes see responses after the first dosing. You know, Michelle, you can sort of speak to this, but, you know, we've had patients that have responded very, very quickly to ADCs. And I think that is something that we definitely see fast. It's it's not like a doxal chemotherapy where it can take a median of, of four months to sort of start to see something slowly happen. These tend to be targeted therapies that you see responses relatively quick. And really it's more about durability and how long do they sustain that matters. And I think that was what really, you know, with Merv, the reason why it got the nod was because it had real dura durability where not all of them have been shown to have that. I'll just mention again, um, you know, when I talked a little bit about TIDAC, it, you know, the supplements are something that people ask that I find patients ask about a lot. Um, should I be taking a multivitamin? Is it okay to take herbal supplements or try kind of non-traditional um, treatments along with my ADC? And that's really something to avoid just because it can affect how the drugs are metabolized. Um, but other than that, um, you know, no, no major restrictions that I can think of. That's a really good question. I, you know, I think ADCs function mostly like chemotherapy, but it's delivered specifically to a specific place based on a specific flag that the tumor expresses. Whereas like the immune checkpoint inhibitors are fundamentally different. They essentially reveal any given tumor to a person's own immune system. So it almost teaches your immune system to recognize your cancer as foreign, like a bacteria or a virus. And then your immune system is galvanized to actually eradicate your tumor. So it's it, it's a very different thing. I mean, these are directly cytotoxic. These are directly tumor damaging agents that are ADCs. Whereas the immune therapy is mostly sort of just teaching your own system to then go and do it. And so I, I think that as a result, the toxicities are radically different between the two, even though we have high hopes for both of those things representing good options for maintenance therapies, because the toxicities tend to be less than what we see in, in conventional cytotoxics. You know, in gynecologic cancer, um, a lot of the cancers that we treat, um, we're, when we're treating them initially, we're um, kind of diminishing or, or, you know, really taking away the fertility prospect. Um, but there are some cancers that we treat where fertility is um, still available to uh, the, you know our patients. Um, if with any chemotherapeutic uh, agent or um, cancer treating med medication, um, it, a lot of these tr uh, target rapidly dividing cells. And so ov your ovaries will be very susceptible to these agents, as well as a, a fetus, um, a growing fetus. They um, are inherently susceptible to all chemotherapeutics. And so um, fertility issues definitely um, are something to discuss with your oncologist and um, definitely something that um, gynecologic oncologists, uh, you know, we hear about often. I don't know if we have great data about whether or not ADCs can be used for fertility preservation. We, 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 we like in the setting, like for instance, TIDVAC to sort of use in patients 
that are early stage. It hasn't been tested in that setting. So we don't really know. It's a fascinating question though. We know that with immune checkpoint inhibitors, you can have preserved fertility from the trophoblastic disease literature, but it's it's hard to know. I, I don't think, do any of us know about the fertility pres on, on preservation on ADCs? Usually by the time we're using them, fertility is not the, because it's always in sort of a, a later line, less early, you're less likely to do fertility pre preservation in the setting that ADCs have been approved. For all of these, you generally can't be intending to have children at the time of treatment. But I think um, the way you described it earlier, with, uh, where this is just a targeted chemotherapy, you know, compared to a very different mechanism. So the reason that ADCs are attractive is because they do deliver a type of chemotherapy to ideally um, more to the cancer cell than other cells. And that chemotherapy would otherwise be too toxic to give like standard chemotherapies. Um, so I agree. I don't think we know. And I think for the clinical trials, in order to get access to these, you couldn't, that, that you know, you certainly can't be pregnant, um, but many of our patients are already, um, like Didi said, uh, Dr. Gerber said, uh, have already received treatments that have affected that or are at an age that they're not um, able to have uh, children anyway. I was gonna chime in quickly just about TIVDAC. Um, you know, I looked it up actually when I saw this question pop up in the chat because I, I also don't know, it, it doesn't come up a lot in clinical practice for all the reasons that everybody spoke to, but there was only animal data looking at fertility and it was reversible. So, you know, there was some decrease in ovulation and development of follicles, but seemed to be more reversible. So perhaps if we do in the future kind of shift these ADCs to first, you know, to earlier lines of treatment, you know, maybe there's some promise that this could be a more, more reversible in terms of fertility compared to other cytotoxic chemotherapy. Um, I actually think that that, yes, the answer is yes. This is exactly, um, one of the two reasons we discontinue a medication, right? So either it's too toxic or it doesn't work. Um, for, for most of our patients who are getting a, 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 their current approval indication, these medications are meant um, as later line treatment. So they are rarely the first thing we go to. So usually our patients are pre-treated or um, advanced disease, et cetera. Um, and so, yes, the main reason we would stop this medication is because of significant side effects, whether that's something as, you know, as common as abnormal lab values, all the way to the more um, rare and more significant side effects of pneumonitis or eye toxicity, heart problems, whatever it may be, depending on the drug. I think that it, it, it does in certain settings, you know, clearly for Mervituximab, biomarker testing was shown in large scale randomized phase three trials, which is our highest level of evidence that the biomarker did predict response, that only the patients whose tumors harbored this biomarker at a greater expression level really responded and received the most benefit for progression-free survival and overall survival. That is not necessarily true with TIDVAC. That's not necessarily true with trope two. That's not necessarily true with CDH6. That's not necessarily true with Claudin 6. The, the next generation of, you know, of, of ADCs is maybe not going to be biomarker driven. It is true. I mean, as Dr. Sasenko said, clearly response was related to the degree of HER2 expression. And they only got approval for her two, three plus expression and now two plus expression in breast cancer. But it was just really heavily overexpressing tumors. So I, I think the answer is it's kind of both. For some things, it's all comers. For some things, it really is going to have to be a very narrow population that you identify. I think most of the scientists in the group will be like, you know, you really want to focus on people that have the biomarker. But if you do enough work, you can find a big enough mosaic that someone's going to have one of the biomarkers and then you triage it. I, that was actually the discussion at, at ESMO was that we're going to get all of these ADCs. There's a huge pipeline of these drugs that Michelle is sort of organizing for our group right now. And the truth is, is that we're going to get a lot of FDA approvals 
and we're not going to know how to sequence these new medicines, and it will be based on the payload. Some of these ADCs have a topotecan-like payload. Some have a paclitaxel-like payload. And you're, you're sort of going to want to use the medicine based on the biomarker and the payload. And that's sort of going to be the future of what we think oncology medicine and specific spa subspaces is going to look like. I want to thank everyone again for uh, to our speakers for participating and to our participants for being interested and kind of, you know, reminding us why we do what we do and uh, being curious. And as uh, things progress and as the cancer space kind of evolves, we are committed to, you know, keeping everyone, uh, you know, abreast of all the the big updates.